Okay, we're ready to start again, so let's go ahead. Let's find our place back in here. Very nice. I never had a problem in my life growing up uh, with uh, people living with dinosaurs. I was raised on Fred Flintstone, so it just made sense to me. But uh, go ahead and find your place, and we're going to move ahead. And Jason's going to present right now astronomy and how it reveals who God is in his creation. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you would give us a great, a great encouragement and great strength, Lord, to be attentive and to really receive what we have now in this next teaching. Bless our, our teacher and our friend Jason in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome him. All right. Well, my, uh, my specialty field is astrophysics, astronomy and physics, and so I want to talk about how the universe declares God's glory. The Bible teaches that it does, and I've found in my experience that there's, there, everything that I've seen in space confirms what the Bible teaches. And so we're going to see how the secrets of the cosmos confirm the Bible, because astronomy is one of those other topics where it's been really just commandeered by the secularists, and they say, you know, you have to believe in that the universe is 13.8 billion years old and that it came into existence in a big bang and the solar system gradually formed from a nebula and so on and Earth's just one planet out of billions where life happened to evolve. The Bible gives us a different account and the Bible's the true history of the universe. So we're gonna see how the secrets of the cosmos confirm the Bible and I think this will be helpful to you. It's a, it's a good way to start a conversation. You know, there's some little did you know things that I think are, are good to, to kind of get the conversation moving forward and get people to realize that no science, when you do it properly, it really does line up with God's word. And it would have to because science is based on the presupposition that God upholds his universe in a consistent way for our benefit. That's a Christian presupposition. That's why science flourished in the Christian West. In any case, we're going to take a look at four secrets of the cosmos that are confirmed, that confirm the Bible, that, sh that show agreement with it. One, we're going to see how the glory of God is revealed in the cosmos. The universe does declare God's glory as the Bible teaches. The Bible's right about that. The universe is not the result of a big bang and just a cosmic accident. It is designed and it's beautiful and it's amazing. It reveals God's glory. So the Bible's right about that. We're gonna see that the Bible is right when it speaks on the basics of astronomy. These are things that you'd learn in a, like a freshman level astronomy class. The Bible does touch on some of those things. The Bible's not an astronomy textbook. People have said that. Well, you can't, you know, the Bible's not an astronomy textbook. I know. It's the Word of God. It's better than any astronomy textbook. Astronomy textbooks, we have to update them every few years when we learn we got some things wrong, right? The Bible will never have to be updated. God got it right the first time. So, but, and, and we'll, we'll see that. There are places now where people will have to admit, yep, the Bible's right about that. And we'll talk about the age of the cosmos because there's some controversy there because the secularists almost universally believe in billions of years. They have to, to make evolution seem plausible, right? Not that it really is, but everybody recognizes it'd be ridiculous on a 6,000 year time scale. And we're gonna see that there's evidence that's consistent with the biblical age of the cosmos of thousands of years. Very compelling evidence. And we're gonna see the uniqueness of the earth, that the earth is not just a pale blue dot, but it is a very special planet where God placed those creatures that he made in his own image. So earth's not, particularly unique in terms of its size or its position in space, but it, is, it does have a unique position in God's plan. This is where God's plan of salvation takes place. That's the best story ever told. It takes place on this planet. So let's dive right in and start with the first category and see how the glory of God's revealed in creation. The Bible says in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And again, you see that beautiful synonymous parallelism. The heavens and skies go together, declare and proclaim go together, the glory of God and the work of his hands go together, saying the same thing using different words, that's synonymous parallelism. And the meaning is that there's something about the universe that when, it, when, we, when we observe it, it, uh, it declares God's glory. It, it shows his essential attributes, his power, his majesty. And not, not in literal words, but, but nonetheless, it's there. And there are a number of ways in which the universe does this, in which it declares God's glory. I'm just gonna focus on two, otherwise we'd be here for millions of years, right? So we're just gonna focus on two. I'm gonna focus on the size of the universe and the beauty of the universe. 
And the beauty of the universe, you don't have to be a PhD astrophysicist to appreciate that. You can go outside on a clear summer night and look up and see the Milky Way, and oh, it's stunning. It's just amazing. Beautiful. And I feel very privileged to live in the time in which we live where we have Hubble images that you can look up on the internet, and they're just, it's amazing. And uh, or now we have the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. And it's just amazing what we can see. The beauty is magnificent. Who would have imagined? The size of the universe, that's harder to convey. That's harder to convey. And I dare say none of us really understand it. We can, we can estimate distances in space, and because we can use things like scientific notation, we can express the distances in a small space, you know, because that's what scientific notation allows you to do. You can express a really big number in a really small space. But the size is not something that we can really grasp in the sense of, get, you know, get, kind of get our bearings on it. And so what I'll do is I'll compare things to other things and kind of build it up for you so you can get kind of a feeling for how big this universe is, give you at least a taste of it, and to think that's what God made. He spoke that into existence. It really gives you just a little taste of the power of God. So we'll start with the moon. The moon is about the same size as the United States if you, in terms of its area. If you were to put the United States at the same distance as the moon, it would cover the same area. And you might say, well, it doesn't seem like it's that big because I can cover it up with my finger, right? And that's because the moon is 240,000 miles away. And that's how big the United States would look if it were 240,000 miles away. And that's an interesting distance because that's, this is the closest object we're going to talk about, the moon. And that distance is about kind of the maximum that I can kind of get. Because if some of you, if you have a really good car, it might have 240,000 miles on it. So you could have driven to the moon, but probably not and back, right? <laughs> so it kind of gives you a feel for it. It gives you a feel for it. And it gives you a feel for the size of these things. And I love showing people the moon through a small telescope, especially when it's in the first quarter phase where, the, the, where you can see the shadows of the craters. When it's full like this, the craters don't show up very well because the, the, the sun is shining down in them and you, you don't cast shadows. But when it's in that first quarter phase, you can tell it's a sphere because of the way the light and shadow work on the craters. It's, it's wonderful. And it's not only a testimony to the beauty of the moon, but to the ingeniousness of the human mind and God having designed our brain Think of the calculation that needs to be done to figure out from light and shadow, that's a sphere. We, we have these built-in trigonometry functions that just, it just computes it, it's amazing. You got this computer in your skull made out of meat, it's just incredible. And when I show people the moon in a small telescope, they're often amazed and they'll, wow, it's amazing. And then they'll ask, can you see the flag that the astronauts planted? When they, no, you can't see the flag. It's, it's the size of the United States, okay? Spend some time on Google Earth and, and kind of figure out, yeah, no. But the interesting thing is we had a spacecraft orbiting the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter, and it, it took such detailed images of the surface of the moon that we actually can see where, where the astronauts landed. It's really amazing. I'm going to show you this. So the astronauts landed in, or the Apollo 11 was in Mare Tranquilitatis, which is this large gray feature you see there. And if we zoom in on that, We'll get increased clarity as we zoom in on it. So just amazing that we can do this these days. So, and quite beautiful too. I mean, the moon has a unique beauty to it as we zoom in on those craters and zoom in a little more and zoom in a little more. And again, you're getting just kind of a feel of how big the moon is, right? And there it is. There's the uh, spacecraft. Remember the, the lunar module? Now, when they, when they landed, they had that spider-like looking structure. And then they, when they launched, they launched only the top portion to save fuel. So the bottom portion is still there. So that's what you're seeing there, the lunar module, the LM. And then um, some other instruments that they left on the surface, you can see that. And then the, you see that dark line that goes over there and back? That's the footprints of the astronauts as they walked over to that crater and back. Isn't that amazing? And you know, 50-year-old footprints, and they're not uh, going anywhere because the moon has no atmosphere, there's no air on it. And its surface is dusty and there's no maid service, so those footprints are gonna be there for a very long time. Isn't that amazing? and beautiful, and there it is in the first quarter phase. That's when you want to look at it through a telescope. And there, there's just a magic to it when you see it. I mean, it, the picture's pretty, but when you see it with your own eyes, it's, I don't know, there's, a, there's something to it. There's something sweet about seeing it with your own eyes, and your brain just immediately figures out that's a sphere, you can tell, because of the, the angle of the light and shadow and so on. So here's the moon compared to the Earth. Yeah, you say, wow, we got a pretty big planet. We went on that, on that category, right? And it is a big planet. If you've ever driven through Kansas, you know the Earth is big. It's big. <laughs> so, 
and it is big and beautiful, and, and what a privilege that we live in a time where we have pictures of the earth from above. That's cool, and it's beautiful. It's just beautiful, something our ancestors could only have imagined. We get pictures of it now. A friend, a friend of mine is an, uh, is an astronaut. He just retired, actually, but he's uh, spent all kinds of time on the International Space Station, and when he has downtime, they don't have a lot of downtime, but when he does, there's a bubble in the lower section of the space station, a window, a curved window, and he sits there and takes pictures of the earth, and it's beautiful. Jeff Williams, you might take a look at his book, uh, he's a devout uh, Christian and a six-day creationist, so cool guy. I got to Skype with him one time when he was on the space station, and that was, that was kind of neat. So you'd say, well, the Earth is big, so we win there until you compare it to Saturn, and you're like, oh, yeah, we, we don't win that one. Saturn's much bigger than the Earth. It's nine Earths across, and that's just the planet. The rings extend out further. The rings are tiny, little tiny moonlets that orbit around Saturn's equator, and really stunning. And so, and if you see Saturn in a telescope, it looks like it's about that big. It's beautiful, and, and, and people are often wild when they see Saturn through the telescope for the first time, because nothing looks like it. And they're like, wow. Really? And then they look down the telescope, like, are you tricking me? Is that a slide? No, that's really what it looks like. And the angle changes depending on the year and so on. So it's, it's, it's fun to look at, so pretty. And it gives you a feel for, hey, the, you know, the Earth's, we're not so big after all. We're not so big after all. The, Saturn's much bigger, but at least we got a big planet in our solar system. Saturn's pretty big, until you compare it to the sun. The sun is 100 Earths across. And you see those little spots on the sun, which astronomers call sunspots, because we're not very creative, apparently. But um, those, are, those are cooler regions on the sun, and so they don't glow as brightly, and so by contrast, they appear dark. But in any case, each one of those would be about the size of the Earth. So that gives you kind of a feel for the size of the sun there. And so you say, yeah, we got a big sun. And, those, and by the way, those little points of light you see in the night sky, those are suns. The sun is a star, if you will. And it, we, we take that for granted in our modern enlightened age, but that was really revolutionary when people started to realize that, that those little points of light are like the sun, they're just much further away. The sun's our next door neighbor, it's only 93 million miles away. Yeah, 93 million miles. How long would it take to drive 93 million miles? About 160 years. That's without bathroom breaks, so. That's impressive. It gives you kind of a feel for it, right? So you can't drive to the sun in your lifetime without speeding. <laughs> and the sun is a star, like the other objects. It's made of hydrogen and helium gas. Those are the two lightest elements. And except the, it, it has so much gravity, the gravity will keep that gas there. Okay, so if you get enough gas and compress it, it'll stay a sphere like that. So there are other stars. Most stars are smaller than the sun. So you say, well, there you go. We got a really big star. There, we can be proud of that, right? So some of the next, some of the nearest neighbors, uh, Wolf 359 is pretty close. Proxima Centauri is the closest uh, star to our solar system, beside, besides the sun. And uh, they're they're smaller than the sun. They're red dwarfs, and most stars are red dwarfs. But there are stars that are bigger than the sun, like uh, Mintaka. That's one of the stars of Orion's belt. You know, there's three blue stars you see in a straight line in the winter. That's Orion's belt, right? You got uh, Al Natak, Al Nalam, and Mintaka. Mintaka is the one on the right, and you can see, and they're all bigger than, than the sun, and and expend far more energy than the sun does. It's really amazing. But there are stars bigger than Mintaka, like uh, Canopus, which you actually can't see, you can't see that from uh, Washington State. It's too far. It's kind of below Earth's south pole. You have to get down to kind of like Texas to be able to see it. But uh, it's a white supergiant. There are stars bigger than Canopus, like uh, Antares, for example, which that's that red star that you see in the southwest this time of year. It's kind of you can tell it's reddish. That's a red supergiant. It's over 600 suns across. So it's amazing, yeah. And um, it, just the power of God to speak this into existence. If you were to take Antares and put it where the sun is, we would be inside it. It would, complete, it, would cover, it would encompass all the planets out to almost Jupiter. Isn't that amazing? So that gives you kind of a feel for the size of some of these stars. And stars get a little bigger than Antares, but there, there is an upper limit on stars, at least its luminosity and probably its size as well. So if we go out a little bit more, there's the rest of our solar system. There's all the, the eight classical planets. Pluto's still there, but he got demoted, so he's not a planet anymore. Very sad, but uh, he's, still, he's still doing fine. He's still orbiting. And the solar system, the sol all the classical planets could fit in a box that's six billion miles on a side. Six billion miles. That so there you go. How long would it take you to drive from Earth to Pluto? It's interesting, because I, I worked that out one time. 
And from, to drive from Earth to Pluto, you know, traveling at 60 miles an hour, something like that, it takes, it takes about 6,000 years. Which is an interesting number, because that means if Adam and Eve, instead of sinning, if they'd started driving on a road to Pluto, <laughs> they would just about be arriving by now. Isn't that neat? So, pretty neat. Now, where's the next star? So there's our solar system, six billion miles. How many boxes like that till you get to the next star? It'd be 4,278 till you get to the next closest star. Space is really empty. And God did it that way so we could see great distances. If everything was jam-packed and you couldn't see very far and you wouldn't know how big it is. So it's a good thing that space is mostly empty. So we have to zoom out quite a bit to see the next kind of object. So that now we're at 60 billion miles. That's 10 times the size of the solar system. And we go out another 10 times. That's 600 billion miles. And about at this scale, you start getting the next uh, smallest objects in the universe, which are nebulae. There's, that's a nebula. Nebula means cloud, and it's a cloud of, but it's not like water vapor, like in Earth's atmosphere. It's a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas. That's the same stuff the sun is made of, and all stars are made of hydrogen and helium. But stars are compact in a sphere. A nebula is spread out over a much larger region. You can see it's much bigger than the solar system, right? And there are different types of nebulae. This is called a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planets. It's just some of them are round. Planetary nebula tend to be round and look kind of like an out-of-focus planet. That's how they get their name. It has nothing to do with planets. And with a planetary nebula, there's a star in the middle that has ejected a lot of its gas out into space. And so that's, and, if, and because the star's hot, it'll heat up that gas, the gas glows, and they're very, very pretty. They're very enjoyable to look at. So that's one of the smaller ones. That's the Julebug Nebula. It's one of the smallest nebulae I could find. If we go out a little deeper into space, you find larger nebulae, like the Ring Nebula. That's a fun, this was one of my favorites because when I was a kid, this was the first that I learned how to find in a, in a small telescope. And you can see this in a small telescope. You just gotta know where to look. It's, it's not too far away from the star Vega. Uh, my book, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, will show you where to point your telescope to see that. And it doesn't take a big telescope. A small one will do it. Now, you won't see the color so much because when you're, when, when you're outside at night and you're looking at something that's faint, you're using the, the rods system in your eyes rather than the cones. And the rods are not, they, they, they can't detect color. So you get, it'd look like a grayscale version of this. But it's so cool to see this glowing smoke ring there in space. There's nothing looks like it. It's so weird. It's about one light year across. Now, I, I mention that because... People get confused about light years because you know, there are galaxies that are billions of light years away. Does that mean they're billions of years old? No. Okay, a, a light year is actually a measure of distance, it, despite the, the fact you hear the term year in it. Um, it's the distance that light would travel in one year, uh, or it's the round trip distance light would travel in one year. But in any case, it's about six trillion miles. So when you, when you hear light year, just multiply it by six trillion, that's the distance in miles. And the Ring Nebula is conveniently about one light year in size, so that's kind of a nice marker. Uh, there are other planetary nebulae that are larger than that, or a little bit larger. Uh, this one, for example. And th this, the, I love these ones, because a lot of these planetary nebulae are, are what we call bipolar, where they have two lobes. And we think that's because the star has, has material orbiting in it, and it channels the flow out the north and south pole of the star. And so you get these two-lobed structures. They're really pretty. And you can see the star in the middle, and so it's still ejecting gas. Sometimes the star collapses in on itself and stops uh, doing that. There are nebulas even larger than that. Larger nebulas tend to have a kind of a random shape. This one's the Horsehead Nebula. It's kind of famous. As we zoom out a little more, you can see it's very, very pretty. Uh, this one is not easy to see in a small telescope because of the color. The rod system in your eyes cannot detect red very well. It's, it's easier to detect green. So if you see a nebula in a book and it's red, you probably can't see it through a telescope. Uh, but cameras will pick it up, though. I photographed this one through my telescope, and it's very pretty. And again, we're, think of how far we're zoomed out now. We're, this, this, is, this section here is about 22 light years across. 22 times 6 trillion equals the number of miles. Okay, So it's amazing. It's just God painting this beautiful artwork in on an enormous canvas. It's really stunning. As we, go to even, as we scale out even further, you get to these objects called globular clusters. I love these things. So some stars are kind of by themselves, like the sun. Some stars come in binary pairs or trinary, three, three stars, and some of them come in these wild clusters. We think there's probably about 100,000 stars in that cluster. And so that's called a globular star cluster. There's open clusters and globulars. I love the globulars. And as pretty as that looks, I'm telling you, when you see it with your own eyes in a telescope, it's even prettier. There's just something about it, seeing these thousands of little points of light and knowing what the Bible says, that God calls them all by their names. God has a name for each one of those stars and a purpose for it. Something to think about. 
It's amazing. All these structures that we've looked at are in a much larger structure. If we zoom out just enormously away from that globular cluster, we find a much larger object, a galaxy. So everything we've looked at is in this. It's in a galaxy like this. And so that's, that's actually another galaxy. We, for, in, until the um, 20th century, the, people could see these things, but they thought they were small and in our galaxy. And then around the 1920s, mid-1920s, they started realizing, actually, those are other galaxies. What you're seeing there is a collection of about 100 billion stars. And so many, it's hard to see any individual one. If you look very closely, you can see these little blue specks. Those are stars in that galaxy. Now, if you see the really bright ones, those are stars in our galaxy. We have to look through ours to see the other ones. And some of our own stars get in the way, so they're kind of photobombing that other galaxy. Okay, but uh, really pretty. And I love looking at galaxies too. They're, they're stunningly beautiful. So again, about 100 billion stars in that structure. And we now know that there are at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe, one for each star in our own. And James Webb is finding even more, so it's really amazing. We find that galaxies sometimes come in clusters Sometimes small clusters of a few, sometimes large clusters of a few thousand. Yeah, this one's called uh, uh, Stefan's Quintet. Uh, this one you can see in a modest size tel. I've seen it in my telescope. It's just it's cool to see these four galaxies. There's four galaxies, and then there's one that's that's photobombing the others. He's actually much closer. But um, isn't that lovely? Very pretty. As we go out even deeper into space, you find galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. Those little specks you see there, those are not stars. They're not individual stars. Each one of those is a galaxy with perhaps 100 billion stars. That's the Hubble Deep Field. That, until recently, that was as far out as we could look. Amazing. Amazing. That's a little section of space in the big, somewhere in the Big Dipper that's relatively empty in our galaxy. So we thought, let's look out and see what else is out there. That's what we found. And they said, and they were surprised because the secularists believe that as you look out deeper into space, it's kind of like looking back in time because it takes the light time to get from there to here. That's a complicated issue. It depends on, there's, Einstein discovered that space and time are not what we intuitively assume they are. And it turns out that, in fact, you can get the light here instantly, depending on, depending on how you define now and things like that. It's, it's, it's an issue I won't get into this evening, but um, my point is the secularists were surprised because they were expecting, they're, they're, in their view, the universe is 13.8 billion years old and started in a Big Bang. The Big Bang formed the first, the three lightest elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium. And then eventually the universe cooled to the point where stars would form from those gases. And so they're expecting that at a certain distance there shouldn't be any galaxies, right? Because they haven't had time, to, you're looking back at, to a time where they hadn't formed yet. And so it was a little surprising to see fully formed galaxies at this incredible distance. So they said, well, we need to look out further. And so they built this wonderful spacecraft, the James Webb Space Telescope. And it is an amazing instrument. It is brilliantly designed. And I, I worked with some of the people at the University of Colorado. I knew some of the people that were working on it. And it's, it's ingenious. And I'm very pleased that it's been so successful. Uh, but I have to tell you, the reason they built it, and they built it to look in infrared light, which is light that's below what we can detect. And they did that for a reason. Galaxies that are far, far away have their light shifted to the red. And once they're beyond a certain distance, even if we had enough light, we couldn't see them because they're below human perception. The frequencies have been shifted to the red. But James Webb is designed to, to detect those frequencies. That's why they built it. So it can go out much further than Hubble. And the goal was they wanted to see galaxies in the process of formation. Because in their view, you're looking back, you're looking back in time, right? And so they're, and they're, they're expecting, well, they made several predictions for what the James Webb Space Telescope should detect. They, they were expecting fewer and fewer galaxies at great distances, because they haven't had time to form yet. And then beyond a, a redshift of 14, that's a, that's a distance in space. Beyond that distance, there shouldn't be any galaxies, because they haven't had time to form yet. That's looking back in time to shortly after the Big Bang, okay? in their view. They're also predicting that the farthest galaxies should ver be very low mass, because the idea is that galaxies start out small and then grow. And, and, combine with other galaxies and gobble up and get bigger and bigger. So the, the early ones, which are the farthest ones in their view, should be small and irregular and clumpy because it takes time to form those nice spiral structures. It takes many rotations to do that. And they were expecting that those farthest galaxies would have no heavy elements, things heavier than lithium. Yeah, you remember your periodic table? You got hydrogen, helium, lithium, and then all these other ones. Astronomers call all these other ones metals. 
okay? Now, it's not the same as the chemistry definition, but the Big Bang is only supposed to produce hydrogen, helium, and lithium. So what should the first stars be made of? Hydrogen, helium, lithium, right? They shouldn't have any of the heavy elements. And then when some of those stars explode, the explosion is supposed to produce the heavier elements. And so then the next generation of stars, which, which gobbles up the star guts from the previous generation, would have some of those heavier elements. So all nearby stars have some heavier elements. But that's in the secular view, that's because they, they're third, second and third generation. Okay. So they're expecting that the farthest galaxies would have no heavy elements. So those are the three secular predictions. You got it? Fewer galaxies at, at great distances and none beyond redshift 14. The farthest galaxies should be low mass and clumpy, and the farthest galaxies should have no heavy elements. You see what's called pop, population three stars. So I'm, I made some predictions too, because I believe what the Bible says, and my predictions are basically the opposite, right? I would expect lots of galaxies at great distances, even beyond redshift 14, because in my view, you're not necessarily looking back in time. You're seeing the universe as it is. It depends on how you define now. It's complicated, but... But I would expect that God didn't just stop creating galaxies at a certain distance. I think they go on way beyond redshift 14, maybe forever. Who knows? But I don't think you, I don't, there's no reason why God would stop there, because I don't believe in the Big Bang. And I believe the farthest galaxies would be fully formed, because I don't think they have, I don't think they evolve over time. I think God created the galaxies pretty much as they are now. I mean, they've, they've moved a little bit since creation, but not a lot. And so I'm expecting the farthest galaxies will be large, massive, very similar to nearby galaxies. And I'm expecting the farthest galaxies will have heavy, heavy elements. Because I know from scripture that God made the heavy elements before he made the stars. Because Earth, remember Earth's made on day one and Earth had water on it, water has oxygen, that's a heavy element. Stars aren't made until day four. So I know the heavy elements already existed when God made the stars. And so I would expect that the farthest galaxies would have some. And I was confident enough in these predictions, I have the courage of my convictions to predict that the secularists would not only be wrong, but I predicted how they would respond when they're wrong. What do you think of that? Because I know that even though, I, I, I'm, I was pretty confident that these would be right and that their predictions would be wrong because mine are the opposite of theirs. And I know something about human nature. I didn't think they would give up the Big Bang because they need that. So my prediction was that when secularists will respond to their failed predictions with statements like, well, Webb discovers that galaxies formed much earlier than previously thought. Because they won't see, gal at the distance where they're looking, they're, they're going to see fully formed galaxies. Instead of, instead of abandoning the Big Bang, they'll just push it back earlier. They'll push back galaxy formation earlier. That was my prediction. Okay. So I made those back in January 21, 2022. That was just after the spacecraft had been launched, but before it had taken any data. It hadn't collected any observations. And you can read the article, and there's the date. It's on our website, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. And then July that year, the first images came back of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope looking out deep into space. Are they gonna find very few galaxies at these distances and none beyond redshift 14? Here's what they found. Galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Again, those are not individual stars that you're seeing. Those fuzzy things, those are all galaxies. Hundreds of billions of stars each, perhaps. So what are the results? Lots of galaxies at great distances. And they even found some beyond redshift 14. Now, they're still in the process of confirming those discoveries, but some of the reports go up to redshift 20. It's way beyond what the Big Bang folks were expecting. The farthest galaxies are fully formed. They're massive and well-structured. They're not low mass and clumpy. They're what I predicted they would be, like nearby galaxies. And they, have help, they detected heavy elements in them. Things like oxygen and carbon, heavy elements. Those have been detected in these farthest galaxies, as I predicted, and opposite the Big Bangers predictions. Well, what about my prediction of how they'll respond to their failed predictions? Webb discovers that galaxies formed, that's, I'm claiming they'll say this, that Webb discovers that galaxies formed much earlier than previously thought. Well, what, what did they say? Galaxies started forming much earlier than many astronomers previously thought. <laughs> UConn today, August 9, 2022. Here's another one. Massive galaxies formed earlier in the universe than previously known. That's a Nature News, July 27, 2022. Here's another one. Evidence is building that the first galaxies formed earlier than expected. Earlier than you expected, right? I was expecting this. I predicted these things. Anyway, um, it's interesting because I was able to make successful predictions because I based my thinking on God's word, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm a competent astrophysicist, but I'm not gonna win the Nobel Prize is my point, but I stand on God's word. And I was able to make correct predictions, not only about the universe, but about how people will respond. Because the Bible not only tells me about the universe, it tells me about the nature of people. 
And so anyway, that was, that was a lot of fun. I had a fun year last year. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's just, and it's just wonderful to see that, isn't it? And to think of God speaking all that into existence. He did it in six days. In fact, what you're seeing here, he did in one day, day four. That's when he made, because if you think about it, God spent five of the creation days working on the earth. He takes one day off, day four, makes everything else. The sun, the moon, the stars also, right? And I love the way the Bible describes the creation of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each. It's summed up in this little phrase. He made the stars also. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Like an afterthought, like it was so easy for God to do that, and it was, because he's God. Well, I could spend a lot of time on that, but it's, it's, it's just wonderful. God's glory is revealed in creation. There's no doubt there. But what about the basics of astronomy? Things you would learn in any freshman level astronomy class. When the Bible touches on astronomy, it's right because it's God's word. And the Bible does touch on astronomy. And the interesting thing about this, this has always been the case, even when the secular experts of the day have disagreed. And I'm gonna give you some examples of this, where statements in the Bible that when they were written, People have said, that's not right. And yet today, in an astronomy class, you'd learn, no, that's exactly right. Shape of the earth, for example. The earth is round, and God teaches that. In Job 26.10, he, the Lord, God, has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. What's that referring to? So he's talking about drawing a circle, but it's a specific circle that occurs at the boundary between light and darkness. That's, what, that's what's called the terminator. The terminator is where uh, evening and morning are occurring on earth. And if you trace that shape, it is in fact a circle. And we're seeing it kind of from, the, from an angle there, but if you, if you rotate it around, it, the, the terminator is always a circle. And the only shape that always has a circular terminator, the boundary between light and darkness, is a sphere. It's the only one. No other shape will have a permanent uh, circular terminator. So the Bible teaches that in Job 26, 10. I think that's pretty interesting. So it's teaching that the boundary between light and darkness, the terminator, where light where evening and morning occurring, is a circle, and that's only possible on a sphere. Now, the interesting thing about that, Job was written around 2000 BC. There's good evidence for that. Um, but the secularists at that time taught the earth was flat. And it wasn't until around 500 BC that some of the pagan cultures started accepting that, you know what? The Bible's right about that. The earth really is round. I don't know if they had access to Job or not, but they started figuring out that it's, it, is, it is round, it's spherical until about 500 BC, all the pagan cultures, as far as I can tell, believed the earth was a flat disk and floated in water. So interestingly, um, pretty neat. By the way, the idea that Christopher Columbus was out to prove the world is round is a myth. Educated people knew the world was round at the time of Columbus. He just thought it'd be faster to go that way. Because, partly because he'd misestimated the size of the earth and also because he didn't know about the Americas. So, but I've seen a, I've seen a globe from, that was built in a, a 14, 1490, 1492, around the, time, around the time of Columbus, somewhere around there, and it doesn't have the Americas on it. It's really interesting, because they didn't know about that yet. So, anyway. Earth floats in space. God hangs the earth on nothing, Job 26.7. Isn't that interesting? Imagine God hanging the earth like a Christmas tree ornament, but he hangs it on nothing. That's neat. God can do that. And we have pictures of it now confirming that that is in fact the nature of the earth. It does float in space. And again, that's written in Job, uh, 2000 BC, something like that. The, at the time, the, the best experts of the pagan cultures taught that the earth floated in water, which frankly makes more sense because we've seen things float in water. We understand buoyancy, but you can't hang something on nothing. You can't, but God did, and he says he did. And we have pictures now that confirm that. Isaiah 40.22 states that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Indicating that God made the universe. He made it big, but he stretched it out. It's a little bigger now than when he first made it, apparently. And so what, what would that look like? Well, if God made it with all these galaxies and he stretched it out, that would mean the galaxies are kind of moving away from each other, right? It's as if the entire universe is getting bigger. That was discovered by scientific means in the 1920s. It's called the Hubble Law. We found that galaxies are indeed moving away from each other. The, universe, the entire universe is getting bigger. It's being stretched out, just like the Bible teaches. Isn't that interesting? Now, some people get a little concerned about that because they think, well, if it's expanding, then that means in the past they were closer together, right? Right. So if you keep going, does that mean, you know, if you go back billions of years, does that mean they were all in one place at one time? And doesn't that mean that the universe exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago? No. 
Just because something's getting bigger doesn't mean it exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago. Some of you are getting bigger. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago, okay? You're just bigger than you used to be, so I, I get it. I understand. So, nor did the Big Bang predict this. That's another thing people think, well, didn't the Big Bang predict that we'll see this expansion and now, now we detect it? No. The expansion was discovered first. It was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang was invented in 1931 by George Lemaitre as a, natural, a naturalistic way of explaining that expansion. Now, he believed in God, but he believed that God had nothing to do, he, he was a materialistic, uh, a, a, a um, philosophical naturalist. He believed that you should leave God out of the equation when you do anything, which doesn't make sense to me, but in any case. So it wasn't a prediction of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is a secular explanation for it. The Bible did predict it. Conservation of mass and energy. The Bible teaches that God ended his work by the seventh day, his work of creation. He's still working, he's just not creating the universe anymore, because he's done with that. And John 1.3 indicates all things are made by him. That means that no new material is gonna come into existence, what we would call mass or energy. Einstein tells us mass and energy really are the same thing, measured in different ways. So if something new popped into existence, that would either mean that God has not ended his work, which the Bible says he has, or it would mean something could come into existence apart from God, which cannot be because all things were made by him. Okay, so nothing new is gonna pop into existence, nor will things cease to exist because Christ upholds all things by the word of his power, and in him all things consist or hold together. So that means no material is gonna cease to exist. And those two principles together basically mean the amount of stuff in the universe, the mass, energy of the universe is constant, it doesn't change. And, and we call that the conservation of, of mass or the conservation of energy. It's a true principle in physics. Now does this preclude a creative miracle? Can God multiply bread and loaves? Of course he can do that. It doesn't, yeah, it, it doesn't mean God can't do a miracle. Of course he can, but in general, he's done his work of creation, so. And again, it's interesting because um, Genesis written around 1446 BC, somewhere around there, and these other testaments are new, or these other passages are New Testament, so that's first century. When was the conservation of mass and energy discovered by scientific means? Conservation of mass, 1785. Conservation of energy, around 1842. So my point is the Bible's speaking of these principles hundreds, if not thousands of years before they were discovered by scientific means. Isn't that interesting? And of course, I, I don't know about all these, but I know with James Joel, he was a Bible believer. And when he discovered conservation, he's, he's sort of the co-discoverer of conservation of energy. But he pointed out in his discovery that, well, it makes sense that energy would be conserved because God has finished creating. So he was informed by the Bible as good scientists are. Innumerable stars. The Bible describes Abraham's descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sandwiches upon the seashore. Uh, a, a metaphor for, or actually a simile for a humanly uncountable number, right? Because it says which, which is too great to be numbered by human beings. God does number the stars and, and gives them each a name, but we can't. And so that's a pretty good analogy. It's a pretty good illustration for an uncountable, a humanly uncountable number, right? That like, it's like the stars of heaven, the sandwiches on the seashore. But it might have been hard to believe when it was written because the number of stars you can see naked eye is somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000 we'd estimate. And so you might think, well, is that really such a good analogy? And then something happened in 1608, the telescope was invented by Hans Lippershey. In 1610, Galileo made a really good one on his own, and he did something that nobody thought to do before, he pointed it up. Because before then, telescopes, oh, you can spy on your neighbor with these things, these are great. He wanted to know what the heavens were made of, and so he pointed it up and he documented what he saw. And if you've never read his book, The Starry Messenger, it's a, it's a short book, it's a delightful read his excitement at seeing things that no human being had ever seen before. It's, it's, it's infectious, it's wonderful. But he found that that Milky Way, that cloudy band you see in the summer sky is hundreds of billions of stars. And you can't count to 100 billion in your lifetime, not that you'd want to, but wow, pretty amazing. And that's just one galaxy. We know now there are at least 100 billion galaxies. So are the stars uncountable by humans? Absolutely, it's a great, great analogy. It's a great analogy. So my question is then, have we learned the lesson of history? Because whenever the experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible's always turned out to be right. How about that? There was a time when they said, no, the earth's flat, and the Bible said the world's round. Well, the people that, that thought the world was flat, they're, they're wrong, right? 
All the, you know, there was a time when the experts thought that there were, the number of stars was less than 3,000. There was a time when they thought there were 1,024 stars. And I, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting story, but I'll save it for another time. But in any case, uh, all the people who disagreed with the Bible are what we call wrong. <laughs> and, and we now know that. So have we learned the lesson today? And it's funny because there are people today who still haven't learned that lesson. There are still secular astronomers who say, yeah, we have to admit the Bible is right about the shape of the earth and expansion of the universe, but it's wrong about, and one of the big ones is, the age of the cosmos. But the interesting thing is the evidence is very consistent with the biblical time scale, and so we're gonna take a look at some of these things. The Bible's right when it addresses the age of the universe and everything within it. We went over this this morning that God created in six days. We found from context, yes, those are ordinary 24-hour uh, earth rotation days. There's no doubt about that from context. Um, but when we look at scientific evidence, and we have to be careful how we do this because science is designed to study the universe the way it works today. It's not really about speculations about the past. So, you, so how do, can we estimate the age of something scientifically? You can make a guess, but um, how do we do this? How do we argue this way? So you need to understand that when secularists, when they make an argument for millions of years, they're making certain assumptions that have gone into that argument, okay? And they have to do that because you can't, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and, and, and measure the age of something by scientific means because we don't have time travel. So they measure certain rates and processes and make certain assumptions and come up with a number that is a guess about the age. So how do, I, how do I argue that, no, that's a bad estimate? I do what's called an internal critique. I need to explain this, because if I don't, people get a little confused. Um, what we do with an internal critique, and it's a very powerful way of refuting somebody, it's where you temporarily assume their position, not in actuality, but for the sake of argument, to show that it leads to absurdity. And it's a method that is endorsed scripturally in passages like uh, Proverbs 26, four and five. You don't want to answer the, the critic, uh, you don't want to actually embrace his assumptions, but you do temporarily stand on them to show that they would lead to an absurd result, okay? So what are the assumptions that secularists make? They assume naturalism, the belief that nature is all that there is, there's no God, or if there is a God, he's within nature, he's not transcendent to it. And so everything that happens, happens within the laws of nature. Basically, the bottom line is that the universe was not supernaturally created and nothing within it was supernaturally created. That's an assumption on their part. They assume that, and they assume uniformitarianism. What's uniformitarianism? It's the belief that present rates and conditions are comparable to past rates and conditions. It's the belief, for example, in geology, it's the belief that the Earth's features, like mountains and canyons and valleys, were formed by the same kind of processes that are happening today and at the same rates. So if you see a canyon today, like the Grand Canyon gets a little bit deeper every year because the Colorado River's cutting it out. The secular assumption would be that it's always been that way, that the Colorado River has always um, carved out the Grand Canyon. Now see, I would, I would reject uniformitarianism, I hope you would too, right? Because I believe in a worldwide flood and that worldwide flood is going to uh, send a lot of water through and cut out that canyon very quickly. So the, the rates in the past were much faster. The rates at which mountains were pushed up, we think during the flood was enormous because we think tecton plate, rapid plate tectonics was occurring, et cetera, et cetera. You get the point. My, the point is I reject those two, don't I? I reject naturalism because I believe the universe was supernaturally created. God didn't use the way he's currently upholding the universe to make it. He did it by other means. And he was doing things during the creation week he's not doing today, like speaking stars into existence. He's not doing that anymore because he ended his work of creation by the seventh day. And I reject uniformitarianism. But what I'm gonna do is look at the evidence and assume these just for the sake of argument and show that they lead to an inconsistent result. Namely, they give an age that's much less than the secular requirement. Okay, so that's called a reductio ad absurdum or an internal critique. It's very powerful. It's often the method that Jesus would use to refute his critics. It's very, very powerful. So for example, there's evidence from the heat from Jupiter that the solar system is much younger than the 4.5 billion years assumed by the secularists. Jupiter receives some energy from the sun, but it also emits energy out into space. And the interesting thing is it emits twice as much energy as it receives. So it gets one unit of energy from the sun and gives away two. In the next moment it gives one and gives away two. And it's been doing that since creation. Isn't that interesting? So there you go. Now, you don't wanna run a business that way, right? I mean, 
I mean, this is kind of how our federal government does, right? It takes in one and gives away two. Yeah, you don't, that's not going to work very long. Well, Jupiter's the same way. If you think about it, it has to be losing energy, right? Because it's, if it's only getting one energy and it's giving away two, it's, it's constantly losing energy. Um, you can think about it like a uh, potato that you've just nuked in the microwave. You've just given it a lot of energy. You take it out, you can feel the heat radiating off of it, right? That's radiative transfer. You can feel the heat. It's emitting heat because it's hot. Um, now, if you come back two hours later, you get a phone call or something, and come back two hours later, oh, it's cold now, isn't it? You don't feel heat coming off of it. It's, come, it's equilibrated. It's come to room temperature. Now, Jupiter is a much bigger potato, and so it can do that for 6,000 years, because it's, it's 10 times the size of the Earth in diameter. It's big. The Earth could fit in that, that red spot that you see there, the giant anticyclone. But in any case, um, what that means is that Jupiter can't be billions of years old because it would have run out of heat billions of years ago. It's a strong indication. It, now, I'm, now, do I... I actually believe Jupiter was supernaturally created a few thousand years ago, but my point is, even if I temporarily make the assumption that it formed naturally from a collapsing nebula and that past rates have been comparable to current rates, you still run it back a few thousand years and, you know, or at least maybe, maybe millions of years, but it, you can't run it back billions of years because it would be dead by now. There would be no heat coming from it. The problem is even worse for Neptune. Neptune gives off 2.6 times as much energy as it receives from the sun every second of every day. It can't do that forever. And it's smaller than Jupiter, so it can't do that for as long. That's an indication that these worlds are thousands of years old, not billions. Earth has a magnetic field. That's what causes your compass to work, right? So magnetic field is caused by electrical current in Earth's core. You may have made an electromagnet at one point, maybe when you were younger and you're in science class and you wrap a coil of wire around like that and touch it to a battery. You'll have a little magnet. You can pick up nails. It's kind of neat. So the Earth has that. It protects us from cosmic radiation, which is bad. It'd give you cancer. So it's nice to have that invisible shield around the planet. But that electrical current is running down because current encounters resistance. Batteries run down. Now, the Earth's got a pretty big battery. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the, remember those big D cells? It, hardly anything uses them anymore, but they lasted forever because they're big. So they, you can get a lot of energy in them. The triple A's, you know, they, don't, they probably won't last through this presentation, but you see what I'm saying. The Earth's big, and so for 6,000 years, it, it's still got that magnetic field. We've been able to measure it, though, and it is dropping. We've been able to measure it for the last century and a half, but assuming uniformitarianism, and we, assuming that it's, it, we expect it to be an exponential decay, that would be the, the kind of process that that would occur. We run it back. Uh, at creation, the magnetic field had been 20 times stronger than it is today. Pretty cool. Pretty neat. You have increased protection from cosmic rays. But if you run that back 60,000 years, it would be so strong it'd rip the iron out of your blood. Yeah, in fact, life wouldn't, be, life wouldn't be possible. It'd be stronger than a neutron star, actually, the magnetic field of a neutron star, which would be lethal. So, and we're not talking a million years. We're talking 60,000 years. So that puts a pretty tight constraint. And, that, and again, I'm, I'm making the secular assumption. I'm assuming that God didn't supernaturally intervene and, you know, and recharge it every few thousand years as it runs down, right? And I'm assuming uniformitarianism, that it's always been an exponential decay with the current half-life. So you see, even assuming the secular parameters, you get an answer that's inconsistent, inconsistent with the secular worldview. You see why that's such a powerful way of arguing? Because the only way they can defeat that argument is to give up their two assumptions, but those are the two assumptions they start with to get the millions of years. It's not just Earth, some of the other planets have strong magnetic fields too, not all of them, but Jupiter does. Jupiter has an enormously powerful magnetic field, which is why you can have aurora borealis, northern lights on Jupiter, which is what you're seeing at the top there. Yeah, pretty amazing. And it's five times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. So pretty amazing. And Uranus and Neptune, they have strong magnetic fields. You can get aurora on Uranus. That's an aurora borealis down there. Isn't that interesting? I think that's the North Pole. So Uranus rotates on its side like that. It's, it's weird. It rolls around the sun. And then the magnetic field is stuck in it at a weird angle. So the magnetic field wobbles. Uranus is just really messed up. So... <laughs> And Neptune, it's not tilted as much, but Neptune's magnetic field is also um, whopper-jawed in there, so it's pretty neat. It's interesting, a friend of mine, Russ Humphreys, now he's a PhD physicist, and he's a biblical creationist like myself. He actually was able to predict the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune based on their biblical age of 6,000 years. He made those predictions back in 1984, and in 1986, Voyager 2 flew past Uranus and measured the magnetic field. The secularists thought it would be dead because they assume it's 4.5 billion years old. The magnetic field should be gone by now. But it's, it was the, the amount that Russ Humphreys had predicted. And likewise with Neptune, which, which Voyager 2 flew past in 1989. 
So again, you see, you start with, you start with the Bible, you tend to get the right answer. There's a reason for that. Lunar recession, did you know the moon is actually spiraling away from the Earth? It gets a little further away from the Earth every year. It's not a huge amount. It's about an inch and a half every year. But we can measure that, because we left reflectors on the moon when we sent the astronauts there back in the late 60s and early 70s. And we can bounce a laser off of that and time it and get the distance to the moon within a fraction of an inch. It's kind of amazing. But we would expect that to happen. It happens because of tides. You might know that the moon causes tides. It pulls on Earth's oceans. And so it's pulling, it's pulling on that ocean and pulling it away from the Earth. You might ask, how, does it, how do you get a bulge on this side? Well, it's pulling the Earth away from that ocean. That's the way to think about it. So it causes the Earth to do that. So you get two tidal bulges. That's where you get, that's where you get high tide and low tide. Um, you know, you get twice a day. But the Earth is rotating counterclockwise as viewed from the North. And it rotates faster than the moon orbits. The moon orbits in the same direction, but slower. And so the tidal bulges always get ahead of the moon. And when they're ahead of the moon, they pull forward on it. And that causes the moon to move out. It's a little counterintuitive, but if you've ever played with a gyroscope, you know when things are spinning, they don't always behave the way you'd expect. But basically, the astronauts, when they want to go into a higher orbit, they thrust forward. It gives them energy, and they move out. They move away from the planet. So, and we can measure that. We'd expect it, which means in the past, the moon would have been closer to the Earth, wouldn't it? Inch and a half every year. You could run it back uh, 6,000 years. The moon would have been 750 feet closer to the Earth. This is not a big deal considering it's 240,000 miles away. It's not even a one-mile difference. But if you run it back millions of years or billions of years, you get a problem very quickly because, and you have to do the math right here because the, the uniformitarian assumption would be not that the rate's constant, but that the change of rate is, is constant. Basically, as the moon gets closer to the Earth, the tidal bulges would be bigger, wouldn't they? Because the gravity's pulling on it harder, and, which means it'd move faster, which means they get bigger and they move faster. And I ran the simulation. It turns out that the Earth and moon would have been touching at 1.4 billion years in a hypothetical past. And you say, well, that's, you know, one, that's a long time, 1.4 billion years. The problem is the Earth and Moon are supposed to be 4.5 billion years old. But you see, they can't be older than 1.4 billion years because 1.4 billion is less than 4.5 billion. In case any of you are Common Core educated, I just wanted to get that out there, okay? So, and even before that would happen, they'd tread each other due to tidal forces anyway. It would, they, they can't, but can't, see, that's an upper limit on the age, isn't it? And a lot of these arguments are like that. They're an upper limit. They're not the true age, they're an upper limit. So the upper limit on the age, so the Earth-Moon system, is less than 1.4 billion years, and yet they're supposed to be 4.5 billion years old. That's a problem. And again, I've made the secular assumptions, naturalism, uniformitarianism. I'm assuming God hasn't supernaturally intervened and said, oh, you're getting a little too far, let's bring you back in. No. And I'm assuming that the rate has been, the rate of change has been constant. So there you go. Comets are an indication of a young solar system. Comets are made up of ice and dirt, and they orbit in elliptical paths going far away from the sun where the ice remains frozen. And they come close and whiplash back out. Okay, so they tend to have orbits like that, like Halley's Comet, right? So anyway. Um, and you think ice getting close to the sun, that can't be good, and you'd be right because the, the solar heat vaporizes that ice, and that's what forms a comet's tail. That's material being pushed away from the comet. Uh, sometimes they have two tails. They'll have a dust tail and an ion tail. They're very pretty. Any of you seen a comet? We had a spectacular one a couple years ago. We had a really great one back if you were uh, back in 96, 97, where we had Hale-Bopp. That was amazing. That was the one I was praying for when I was a kid, and, and God delivered, because it was a record breaker. Anyway. Uh, so every time you see a comet, it's getting smaller. It's losing mass. And we can measure the rate at which the material is being depleted because we can see it. And we know the amount of material that's there. The nucleus of a comet, the source of the ice, is a few miles across. And so we do the math. A typical comet can last no more than about 100,000 years. And then they're gone. And so the problem is, if the solar system were 4.5 billion years old, shouldn't it have run out of comets by now? Like a long time ago? I've seen comets that have gone behind the sun and then they've been totally obliterated in one pass. I've seen comets that don't exist anymore. They have been destroyed. Comet Ison does not exist anymore. It's gone. So anyway, uh, so that's a problem. And there's always a rescuing device. My secular colleagues would say, well, there must be a source of new comets to replenish them which they call the Oort cloud. If you ever heard of the Oort cloud, it's the idea that there's a bunch of potential comets out way beyond Neptune where we can't see them. 
they're conveniently out of the range of our most powerful instruments. And the idea is every now and then one of these potential comets gets dislodged from this circular or spherical cloud and thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. So as the old ones disintegrate, new ones replace them. That's pretty clever. And you'll find that in the textbooks, but that's the only place you'll find the Oort cloud is in the textbooks. You won't see it in your telescope. As far as I can tell, there's no evidence of it. But anyway, it just shows you there's always a rescuing device. There's always an escape plan. Uh, Pluto is a powerful evidence of a young solar system. The secularists were expecting Pluto would be totally covered with craters and would have no mountains and valleys and things like that because those require heat to make, to make the geology move, to get things like tectonics and, and so on. And Pluto, being you know, four billion miles away from the sun, it's not going to have enough energy, and it's small. It's only two-thirds the size of Earth's moon. So it's not going it, it can't retain any heat that it had to be, at the beginning. It can't retain it very long, because it's so small. It's like the AAA battery that just doesn't last very long. And there's a lot of other stuff orbiting out at the distance of Pluto. And over 4.5 billion years, basically all of it should have hit Pluto by now. So it should be totally covered with craters, no mountains, no valleys, no geology. And so they were very surprised when we sent the New Horizons spacecraft, which flew past Pluto in 2015, to find all kinds of interesting features. This section right here, Tomba Regio, well, in Sputnik, Sputnik um, Planitia in particular, there's not a single crater in there. There's not one crater in it. That can't be billions of years old, okay? That's, that indicates recent activity. Now, there are some craters on Pluto. We'd expect some in 6,000 years, but there's not billions of years worth. And they were expecting no mountains, but what do you see there? Mountains. And remember, Pluto is only two-thirds the size of the moon. Those mountains are larger than the Rockies, or at least comparable to the Rocky Mountains. But they're made of ice instead of rock, uh, which is interesting. At that distance, ice is as hard as rock because it's so cold. So you can have a different kind of geology out there. Pretty neat. So there's mountains, valleys. It's just amazing. Pluto's largest moon, Charon, same thing. There's a few craters. There's some, but there's also valleys and, and, and mountains that you can see there and chasms. It's really impressive. So totally unexpected from a secular perspective, but that's kind of what I was expecting. So that was pretty neat. Spiral galaxies are an indication of the youth of the, of the universe because spiral galaxies, not all galaxies are spiral, but a lot of them are, and they rotate differentially, meaning the inner portions rotate fast and the outer portions rotate slower. And what that means is, if you think about it, that means that spiral structure would have to get tighter and tighter over time, wouldn't it? Now, secularists believe that typical galaxies are about 10 billion years old. So I wondered, what would it look like if it were 10 billion years old? If I take a galaxy like that and let it rotate, because we've measured the speed of the stars, and so I wrote a computer simulation to run the stars over hundreds of millions of years. The number that you see in the bottom there is the number of million years. Okay, now, so if it, it should go out to about 10, so it be, should be 10, 0, 0, 0. That, that would be 10 billion years. But I found that after I ran it a really short period of time, that spiral structure became so tight, it doesn't resemble any galaxy we've ever seen. That's 100 million years right there, and it's already twisted beyond recognition. Isn't that fascinating? There's 200 million years, and so on. I didn't even bother running it out to 10 billion, because you can see it looks like an old-fashioned phonograph record by the time you hit 300 million. And now there's no galaxy in the universe I've ever seen that looks like that. None of them are twisted that tight, which means none of them are even one billion years old. So, and a lot of stuff like that. The, the stars, blue stars, for example, there's different stars out there. Some of them are blue. blue. Blue stars are the hottest, most luminous stars in the galaxy. They expend their energy very quickly. They can't last billions of years. They're the most massive stars. And so they have the most fuel available, the most hydrogen gas but they use up that fuel very quickly. They're kind of like the SUV of the star world. They got a big gas tank, but they get very poor gas mileage, and so they can't go very far in time, okay? So there it is, and so, and, and secularists will admit that. There's no doubt, blue stars can't last billions of years. They would say they must have formed recently, but nobody's ever seen that happen. Nobody's ever seen a star form. So you see, the evidence is really consistent with the biblical age of the cosmos of thousands of years. The evidence, even when we make this secular assumptions of naturalism and uniformitarianism and, and run them back, you'll find that the maximum age of many of these things is much less than the secular requirement. And then finally, I want to briefly talk about the uniqueness of the earth. And the, the Bible's right about the special nature of the earth, the planet that God formed to be inhabited. The Bible says this in Isaiah 45, 18. He's the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. God's purpose for making the earth was to put life on it. 
and in particular the, the life forms that, that bear his image. That's a special privilege that we have, of course. Now, the other objects that God created, the other worlds out there, and there are a lot of them, and they're wonderful, like the moon, wonderful. But God didn't form it to be inhabited, okay? God did form, the moon does help life on the earth because it, it causes tides, and that keeps the oceans from stagnating and so on. So the moon does serve a purpose in helping life on earth, and it helps us to keep time. It's how we get months is from the moon. But it's not designed to have life on its surface. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, who walked on the surface of the moon, called it a magnificent desolation. I think that's a wonderful description of the nature of the moon. It's, it has a beauty to it, but it's a desolate beauty. It doesn't have the color, it doesn't have the life that Earth has. Earth's neighbors, you got Venus and Mercury, they're closer to the sun than Earth. You got Mars, a little bit further away from the sun. Well, there were some secularists that thought Venus might have all kinds of exotic life on its surface, aliens, alien life out there, and it's always the, the holy grail of the secularist, I think. And they were free to speculate because Venus is permanently enshrouded in clouds. And so it's always nice, if you're an evolutionist, it's always nice when you can speculate unfettered by inconvenient data. So there you go. So they were free to speculate how it might be a tropical world because it's a little closer to the sun, might have all kinds of exotic life forms on its surface. That was before they discovered that the surface temperature is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, Venus has an incredibly thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide, which is a mild greenhouse gas, but if you get enough of it, it becomes pretty substantial. So Venus, and people complain, well, Earth might end up that way. No, Earth has a very thin atmosphere. That'll never happen on Earth. It can't. We don't have enough atmosphere. But Venus is a hundred, has a hundred times more atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure is a hundred times that of the Earth. So if you were on Venus, you'd be crushed like a tin can, or you'd burn up almost immediately. Or those clouds made up of sulfuric acid, so that could kill you. There's lots of ways to die on Venus. You're not going to live very long. Yeah. It's not a place you want to visit on your next vacation. And people ask, why did God make it you know, with a toxic atmosphere and sulfuric acid? Cloud? We're not supposed to go there. He didn't make it a vacation spot, right? He made it to be beautiful. Those clouds are highly reflective. They make Venus the, the third brightest object in our sky. You got sun, moon, Venus. It's that bright star that you've been seeing in the west, and now you're seeing it. If you get up before sunrise, you go, you'll start to see it in the east. It'll creep up at, before dawn. So anyway, and you got Mars a little further away. So Mars, um, it's about half the size of the Earth, and it's a little better for, for life in that it would, it would kill you slower, okay? <laughs> You, you could live for a few minutes on Mars, perhaps, uh, because you can't breathe, because it, it doesn't have an atmosphere of oxygen. It's got a thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide, so you can't breathe there. That would be an issue. Uh, the the, the temperature is a little too low on Mars, so you'd probably freeze to death, but uh, you might get a nice view in the few minutes before you suffocate to death. So <laughs> it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? Those planets are too hot, that one's too cold, that one's just right, yeah, because it's made for life. It's made for life. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't expect to find uh, life out in space, because God formed the earth uh, to be inhabited. And there, there's a lot of motivation to find extraterrestrial life, because I think part of it is a, is a vindication of evolution. If life's just a cosmic accident, hey, it's a big universe. The chemistry's probably right elsewhere, so it probably evolved there too. But biblically, um, earth really is very special. God, this is the place that God made for life. He made it to be inhabited. Um, there's some theological issues you'd run into if you believe in Vulcans and Klingons and things like that. Um, and I, I like science fiction, I really do. But the real universe is the biblical universe. So I don't expect to find life in space. Um, I'm gonna not spend too much time on that because it's, it's, it's fun to talk about those things. But um, it, it, the Earth really is very special. And um, you know, one of the astronauts who walked on the moon, Jim Irwin, he, uh, at the time he was not a Christian and then later he became a Christian and a very devout Christian, and a six-day creationist. He even went on some searches for uh, Noah's Ark, which he didn't find, but it, was, it shows you that he, you know, he believes Genesis. And he's um, quoted, he, he, one time, he one time said something to the, the effect, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, the amazing thing is not that man walked on the moon, but that God walked on the earth. And I think that's an awesome way to think about it. We live on a very special and beautiful planet that uh, certainly declares God's glory, as does the whole universe. So I hope you've been encouraged by that. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the resources, but I will point out the astronomy ones. So taking back astronomy covers a lot of what I covered in this presentation, other than the James Webb stuff, which is new. So that's, and, and the DVD as well, covers a lot of what I covered today, except the James Webb stuff, which is new. So you might check those out. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, if you wanna learn how to find some of these things, that's the book you're gonna wanna get. And that's just a fun resource, and it's gonna show you how to, 
how to find these things. And it, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can see naked eye. You don't need a telescope for it. You just need to know where to look. Or binoculars. You can see Jupiter's moons in binoculars. Saturn's rings. If you've got a good pair of binoculars, you can see Saturn's rings. You've just got to know which one's Saturn. And that's where the book's going to help you out. So uh, if you want to get a telescope, what kind you might want to get and how to use it. So that's a fun resource as well. So check out Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. Uh, another book I'll mention too, just because some people ask about the distant starlight issue. I've written about that a lot. There's stuff on the website. But I also wrote a book called The Physics of Einstein that answers that question and shows you that it doesn't take millions of years to get the light from there. Uh, to hear. So we, we understand enough about the physics of Einstein to understand it doesn't even take a miracle. I mean, God could do anything miraculously, but he didn't have to in that case. And also things like, what about black holes and time travel? Is that possible? And so on. Truth is stranger than fiction, folks. And it's going to take you through and, and show you what Einstein discovered and how we can apply that in a, in a Christian creation worldview. It's written at a layman level, but there are in-depth boxes because I... The, I, I, I'm a nerd, and I like the details. So, but you can skip the boxes if you want to, or you can go through it. It's just it's high school stuff. But a lot of people, when they see math, their eyes glaze over, and I can't handle that. So anyway, I think it's beautiful. So you might check that out. And uh, of course, don't don't forget about the packs, which we'll have just here for today. It's your last chance to order the packs. We're out of them, but we can we'll ship them to you for free if you want to go and purchase them here. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter as well, and check us out on the web, Biblical Science Institute. Com. So I want to thank you very much for having me out to speak. I really appreciate it. God bless. Amen. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and stand. And as you're standing, I'd just like to read a scripture that can be very helpful after we just saw this presentation. Out of Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So every one of us here tonight have no excuses for not following the Lord Jesus Christ, believing him to be our Savior and Lord, how he wants to have a relationship with each one of us, how he wants us to walk with him, experience his lordship in our life. And I want to pray about that now. So Father in heaven, thank you for this presentation. But the application of these biblical truths is to draw near to you. And if you're here tonight or watching, and if you've yet to come to that place of surrender, I pray that the grace of God and the love of God would lead you to a place of desiring to have a right relationship with God. The evidence has been given to us tonight Jesus, forgive me, forgive us. We've sinned against you. We accept the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ for dying on the cross, and rising again from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, and calling us to a place of surrender. May we receive your forgiveness and love tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And just uh, so that you know, too, if you want to receive any information about our ministry, we also send out an e-bulletin. On Monday, there's a little card by the offering box by the doors. You can fill that out if you'd like. Tomorrow night, we have a prayer gathering at 7 o'clock. And then Tuesday, that is this Tuesday, in a couple of days, we have a gathering for high school students only. So those going into high school, those that are just graduated and are leaving, and we're so grateful for Kim and Shane Wickers right over there with their hands raised. Both of them have been coaches and teachers in our community for over 20 years, and they're going to encourage our students. It's going to be at our home at 7 o'clock, and my daughter and Scott, uh, daughter Jamie and Scott are here if you need help and directions, talk to them afterwards. Wednesday night at 7, we have a Bible study here in Proverbs chapter 3. Hope you can join with us. We're available afterwards for prayer. God bless you. Thanks for coming and being a part of tonight. Let's give it up for our speaker.